My name is Chris Regan. I'm the writer of Painful Massacre. Uh, prior to that, I worked on the crime thriller London Heist, uh, the action film Tender Men, um, and uh, at various short films. And uh, I also did a web series called Paz vs. Stuff, which is a kind of horror uh, web series. The thing that excited me most about working on Painful Massacre was, was basically just the idea of working on a, on a horror film. Uh, everything I've done prior to this has been really in the crime or action film genre uh, and even stuff I've written that that um, uh, you know commissions and things that haven't made it to production have all been in that kind of genre really uh, which isn't isn't really a genre that I, I love but I do love horror films I've, I've always been a huge horror fan um, and the stuff that I've written, the projects that I've worked on completely independently have always been horror themed. Paz vs. Stuff, the web series I did was a horror web series. But the short films I've made that I've directed have been horror comedies, but still very much on the horror side. So, um, yeah, the idea of actually working on a, on, a, on a horror film was really appealing. Obviously, there are so many factors in, in, in go, that go into the decision to work on something, but the really the most important thing to me is is will this actually be made when you was when you look at when you're talking about independent films and there's there's it's it's such a hard thing to do to make a film um and to actually finish it and to put it out there that was my big concern was i've, I've worked on so many projects i mean i've worked on projects that have just gone on for years uh with no kind of nothing to show for it in the end um and yeah, I learned a lot from those projects, but I really wanted to make sure that if I was working on this, that, that it would be um, uh, uh, produced and I would actually have something to show for it at the end. And and also it, it was an opportunity to work with friends um, and, and make some new contacts, work with some some new contacts as well. Um, but primarily it was it was the idea of working on a horror film, working in a genre that I, I really love. Um, and and I thought I could bring a lot to that. I think what happens what happened with the slasher genre is that it became the appeal of the genre became a bit misunderstood, and it became more about introducing as many unlikable characters as possible, and then just killing them off in the most gruesome, disgusting way possible. And and I never really got on with that I never really understood why you know you you watch a film because you want to sort of have some empathy for the characters and go on this journey with them but if you're introduced to all these characters who are all awful I don't really get anything from just seeing them killed in various ways so I wanted to find a way of turning that on, on its head and making it more interesting the the, ba the, the basic idea was there it was a group of people on a high school union go paintballing. In terms of what was there already, they had the idea of the 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 guy the people get there was a killer and he was killing people in a way that was sort of related to their jobs somehow. And they had a few of the deaths worked out, like the optician getting his eyes poked out and things like that. So some of that was already there. It sort of struck me that this, this, especially the killing in the manner of their jobs, uh, which you know could be quite an, a, a sort of extreme idea and a bit sort of over the top. But actually, it, there was something about it that sounded a bit Agatha Christie. So I, I sort of went and read, uh, and then there were none, which um, is, if you don't know, it was written in 1939, I think. And it was, it's, it's these eight people go to this island where they've all been summoned for various reasons and uh, they've all got sort of skeletons in their closets and stuff going on uh, and then one by one they are killed and they're killed in very sort of bizarre ways um, and what was interesting about reading that book well for me it gave me the plot it was like well what they're doing and what they do and, and then there were none is they're trying to figure out what happened they're trying to figure out who's killing them is it one of them doing it uh, why is this happening um, and they all kind of pair up and they move off in different groups and um, and they're trying to figure it out. So there was there was always that, like, there was always something to do. There was some kind of action. There was uh, a conflict there between them and there was a goal. We need to find out who's doing this. So 
that gave me the structure then. I was like, right, we're doing and then there were none, but with paintball. Um, the other thing that I took from it, that, well, that I sort of brought to the project that really helped move it forward for me, uh, was my own, like one, one sort of paintball experience, um, which <laughs> it was, it was fairly minimal and from what I gather fairly unusual, but it, it, it sort of gave me, I think without that, I think I would have been a bit, I don't think I would have really understood, but probably only, only probably like a year or two prior to working on this, I went, I was on a, a stag weekend and we went paintballing and it was just the most, it was the, it was quite a bizarre experience because we would, we, none of us, even the stag, we, we, we weren't really paintball-y types. It was just a thing that you're supposed to do on stag weekends. This experience of being in the middle of nowhere, that was all a bit kind of, I mean, it's funny, speaking to Joe and Brendan about it when we were writing the script, I sort of realised, okay, what that experience that I had was, was quite, wasn't, what it was supposed to be like <laughs> but, um, um, and we ended up I think the paintball in our script is a lot more legit um, but I took a lot there was certainly that idea of, of um, isolation and you know the thing with it being hung over and the opposing team I mean all those moments were things that had, that had happened on that weekend so I think I brought that to it as well so I sort of took Real paintball, awful paintball experience, Agatha Christie, and and the bits of scripts, bits of story that we had, and sort of funneled that into a thing and and came out with the with the script. So the writing process was really I took the uh, the idea that um, uh, Brendan and Joe had, had sent to me and Darren uh, that they'd been sort of talking about, and I turned that into a, a five page outline. Uh, a, a lot of it was to do with the for me the most important thing was figuring out who the characters were because I really wanted we we sort of agreed I think in early on that it would be 10 characters um, and so yeah a lot of that initial process was working out I mean even basic stuff like even working out names and their jobs and things like that who they were just I think they had a, a sentence for each one but that was really important. Once I've got that, it was like, okay, this is, because the, the film is very much about these 10 people in the woods. I mean, that's all you're going to see in the film. So um, it was very important to work that out. Uh, and then we then there was a sort of, yeah, five page outline, which is very, very kind of roughly worked out the, just the sequence of events really, you know, where everyone would be going, who they'd be meeting up with, uh, what what they would discover and what the deaths would be. Um, and we, we, we kind of sent, I think that was sent back and forth a few times. We I just kind of amended it until, uh, Joe and Brendan, Darren were all, all happy. Uh, yeah, so it was five, five page outline. And then the first draft, I think I wrote in about a month. Um, I, and overall I was, I mean, I checked it was, it was six numbered drafts over about four months. At a certain point, I can't remember whether it was draft five or six, but at a certain point we did a read through. I always really like to do a read through. It doesn't have to be with the with the main cast. It can be, um, you know, with whoever. But I like to hear it out loud at a certain point because if, if you're working on your own on these things, as you often are, I, it's really hard to hear at a certain point. It just becomes impossible to hear how it actually sounds and how particularly the interactions between characters so we did a read through in london which is great it was the first time i'd met joe uh because we'd sort of chatted i think mostly over email at that point but um uh, so joe the, the joe hallett the producer that's the first time we'd met and then and darren and brendan came along uh and then we just got mostly just our friends in to read i think the the first ad read apart and um uh, a couple of my friends came and uh but it was really useful. It was like that's it's massively important because you, you start to get a sense of uh, the pace of it and which bits are slow. You get an idea of which bits are funny, uh, and it's never usually bits you expect, um, uh, which is sort of <laughs> sad or bad. I don't know, but um, yeah, it's uh, it, that's really important. So we so we did that. There are a couple of obvious bits that is stolen <laughs> from other films that I should mention I suppose uh, the, the, 
I mean, they're pretty well. They're obvious if you if you know films, I suppose. I mean, there's the the the, the pattern speech. Well, to be fair, the pattern speech is from real life, um, but was made famous from the film. But uh, yeah, Dan Brendan's character does a version of the pattern speech, sort of amended for paintball, and then um, uh, Nicholas Vince basically does the. I mean, it's a Somerset Maugham story, but he does it. it the Boris Karloff bit from Targets, um, <laughs> which um, I suppose I should explain. So that that needs a bit more explanation. So in um, in Targets, which is this uh, Peter Bogdanovich film, uh, Boris Karloff plays a version of himself. He plays this aging kind of uh, horror actor, uh, and uh, there's this one really brilliant scene where he does the um the Somerset Warm story um about death turning up in there because I didn't just want to do the standard don't go down to the quarry where they do the paintballing it's bad um and I remember this this scene from Targets with Boris Koloff and I was like well he's our Boris Koloff really he's the our sort of um uh famous sort of horror actor uh so I so I just sort of adapted that and made it about the um the quarry and him losing I mean it's a bit it's a bit silly really but I quite liked the 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 sort of you know the the one person watching might get that or might just get annoyed that that I've stolen it from from a, a Peter Bogdanovich film um so there was there was that in terms of the influences there were two I think there was one main one and one sort of smaller one so the but the the biggest influence there was a Norwegian film called Cold Prey um but what's what's great about that film is the the characters weren't annoying, that you they're so kind of well written and acted that you have a tremendous amount of sympathy for them and the in the situation and then, and it was one of the few times watching a slasher film where when the killing started happening I kind of felt well, I don't want any of these people to die which is how you should feel <laughs> that's that 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 that's correct mm. but that's what I wanted for this. I wanted to make sure that the the characters were nice, interesting people. They were people that we would get along with, and that we wouldn't want them to die. Uh, and then the other one, I suppose I should mention, is um, uh, the Strangers, which is the the sort of home invasion film. And the end, I really wanted. I wanted to do it about basically nick the ending. <laughs> so going back to stealing stuff. Mm-hmm. I love the ending of that film. I know it, it's very divisive. A lot of people don't. Um, a lot of people prefer the sequel, which is more clear cut. But I love the moment in that film where they take the masks off and you don't see their faces because because it doesn't matter. Like, um, it really doesn't matter what, at that point, what happened. And it, cause that, cause that ending kind of tied into... Um, you know, going back to sort of the literary influences, that, and then there were none. But it's an example of a similar type of film with you know masked killers that had this really open, ambiguous ending. Uh, and when we were working on the ending in sort of post-production, I really tried um, to sort of stress that that's how it should look, <laughs> like that it should look like the end. There's this great. I know we have sort of just nicked it, but this is the shot in The Strangers as they, they lift off the masks and as soon as they take the masks off it, it cuts away. And it's just, just it's just great. I think it's great filmmaking. And I think, I love the, what that leaves you with, because it leaves you with this uncertainty and this, but also this idea, it leaves you with something to talk about. Um, so yeah, so that was a big influence as well. So yeah, certainly Cold Prey and The Strangers were, were big influences for me in writing the script. I think my favorite scene, and this, <laughs> it's probably obvious from because it's probably the most overwritten scene, but it's it it's Sora's too fast too furious speech. the The reason is my favourite. <laughs> I mean, I mean partly because I love the Fast and Furious films, but that for me was the scene that 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 was how I came to get into the script. I need a thing. I need. I need to sort of something that helps me understand why this is going to be great, and and for me that was the the Sora scene. And in my head, 
so then this idea of this this carpenter she just sort of became this kind of stoner character in my head and um and i thought oh i had this speech this this star trek speech from this other script so i sort of put that in and then i tried to work out okay well, how does this make this make sense and then i sort of had it that the star trek the star trek movies were her thing so she's always talking about star trek movies and that and her and sora's whole character is about really trying to get jess to remember she has this completely different memory of of secondary school than Jess does. For as far as Sora is concerned, her and Jess were best friends in in school, and Jess doesn't really remember it like that, which kind of breaks Sora's heart a bit. And um, so she was really looking forward to having this reunion just to meet Jess, and and what well, she was hoping Jess would be there, and she is, and it's this big thing, and then Jess doesn't really care. Um, so so she's trying to remember remind her of these Star Trek films, and. <laughs> so when we did the read through the first read through we did it was this really te- great but also telling moment where we got to that moment and he does the, 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 the uh, sorry sorry does the Spock line and everyone over the age of 35 creased up and <laughs> anyone, everyone younger had no idea um, what this was about and I was like it was it the re- they did it in the remake as well but anyway <laughs> So I was sort of already at that point, so I need to realise, okay, I need to let this scene go. So then I was trying to think of an equivalent, something else we could use, and I, had to, I wanted it to be a series, I wanted it to be uh, and, and somehow related. And I was looking at films, I went onto IMDb and, and went through, I sort of worked out, well, how old are these characters? When would they have been at school? What were the big films that came out? And it was things like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings were sort of big then. I was thinking, well... There's already been so many jokes about Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, and it just seemed I didn't feel like I could get any mileage out of those. Uh, and then I saw that the Fast and Furious series was started around then. Well, it was around the time of, I guess I can't remember exactly when it worked out that they would have been in school, but it was around the time of Too Fast, Too Furious. Obviously, the Fast and Furious films are all about family, but Too Fast, Too Furious is all about friendship. It's all about the friendship between. Paul Walker and Tyrese and, and this, this thing that happened when they were kids I'm gonna, just going to do the speech now um, so when that clicked I was like well that's it that's I'll use that one uh, and then I kind of watched the film again which I'm happy to do anytime I've seen it many times already um, and and the scene where they talk about that where the two characters talk about it was like oh this is amazing we'll just um, do that uh, and I, I think I always thought it would get cut at some point and maybe, <laughs> maybe it should have been, <laughs> but uh, I, I kind of love that it's in there, and and it makes me happy that there's a some Fast and Furious love in this film. I mean, this was this was the hardest thing, really. Was the hardest thing in the in the script was developing the characters, and making sure they were all, making sure they were all different, and it kind of developed over over time. I mean, I can I can talk about a few specific examples. Nathan, I think, came about mostly with the idea of the the opening really like trying to work out okay I can't, I can't remember how late in that came but I think I always had this idea of him being having depression and, and being suicidal and I thought uh, that's um, yeah that came from his his character really developed out of that and yeah, a lot of it uh, and this idea of the I guess the idea of when we're talking about him being a fireman this idea of that not working out for him uh, because we'd already got Dan, who was who was the kind of wanted to be the hero, the kind of alpha male, I suppose. Uh, so I didn't want Nathan to be that. I wanted him to be a bit more sensitive, uh, and so that to me was Nathan, the, the someone who the the horror of that job, or what potentially that job, it, it kind of really got to him. Um, um, but somehow dealing with this other horror, this new horror. He kind of comes out the other side of it, except he doesn't. Um, so that was, yeah, that was him. Um, Jess was very much about someone who was defined by by Simon, by her fiance, um, which became important from the script. But it became it came from her character first, really, before it even before we'd even got to all the who's the killer kind of stuff. Um, uh, Jess was very much everything she said was about Simon uh, you know if someone, anyone asked her a question about her she would respond with I'm doing this with Simon and Simon said I should do this 
and and so on so um yeah that was that was kind of important because you that's 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 her sort her sort of story because the it's kind of realizing that she's in this kind of coercive basically abusive relationship that she needs to move on from but i also quite like the idea again just sort of subverting things a little bit of someone who of an alcoholic who by the end of the film embraces alcohol in order to move on so um then uh yeah i suppose the other interesting character is is lauren um initially when i got the when when uh i got the outline through there was always this idea of having one of the characters be a, a glamour model and sort of in in the day like the the character would be a glamour model not the actor but like the uh and i initially really was really resistant to that idea because i just it just seemed a bit exploitative and oh so we're going to get um someone to be in this role for um yeah exploitative reasons rather than plot or story reasons so i had i was thinking about people i knew and and a few a couple of friends who don't actually know each other but knew a real famous glamour model who they were at school with and both had said that at school she was um just not a bit of a bully really which is why I'm not mentioning any names, <laughs> but um, you know, was 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 not uh, not a nice person. Um, so that kind of stuck with me, and I thought, well, okay, that's the way to go with with this character is that she's just enjoyably horrible. Uh, Aiden was another character who was awful, <laughs> and he was really fun to write. But I think I sort of I wrote him a bit over the top, and I know I think Joe toned him down quite a bit in the performance, which was probably the right thing to do. It was quite a silly um, uh, uh, sort of exaggeration of a character in the in the script. So um, uh, yeah, but but obviously he's his whole thing that he's is is he he is genuinely the, the I suppose he's the the, the 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 bad guy of the script, the antagonist at the beginning. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yes, I guess the answer to the question, it was just about finding moments for each of those characters to reveal those little little things that we'd worked out, um, uh, and and part of that was by pa- pairing them up with different characters. So it wasn't just that they would, you know, it's not just that Sora and Jess spend the whole film together, you know they break off and they deal with different people so different things come out of the conversation but yeah that was that was how it was done really this is quite a difficult one because i ended up being quite involved in the uh in the post-production of the film uh which was great uh for a writer really for me it was um when you've got the footage there um and there was a big concern that um there wasn't enough because I think the, the the shoot had been quite tough in places, and that there'd been a lot of issues with weather and scheduling and all kinds of things, and so there was a concern that there there was a lot of stuff that hadn't been shot, and and so where I beca- really became involved was in um, trying to work out what how much of this the scenes that hadn't been shot could we still could we do without could anything be changed could anything be cut could we film some new scenes that would sort of just plaster over some of the cracks i suppose uh joe was um really got me involved in the in the in the in, in the edits and, and giving feedback on the edits which was really which was really good like I, I felt like uh it was I felt like I was able to add a lot to that, but it was, it, but it was also nice to be able to have the opportunity to say, "Oh, this isn't quite how I imagined it." Um, but if you just cut out a couple of seconds here, that will it will work. But as a result, I didn't really, I don't really feel like the the finished film was much different from how I intended. But obviously, it is there was stuff that was lost. Um, there were bits that maybe didn't work out as well as I wanted them to, I suppose, just for practical reasons. Um, uh, but 
but then there were so many bits that worked out a lot better um certainly in terms of the the, the general story and theme and characters of the script i don't think there's anything that was that was kind of missing from that so yes yeah, so i'm really happy with it i, I think it, it's come out really well i'd worked with uh darren and brendan before uh so yeah we were quite used to working together and then uh with joe i as i said I didn't really meet him until later on in the process but then we ended up working really closely together on the in the post-production which was really, was really was really good um and really rewarding and it was uh like i think his he and his family had put so much into this film and it was really nice to be able to go uh to go on to the reshoots and sort of see that firsthand and um and kind of um uh, be involved in it and uh and i think that's also uh you know, you're part of the reason i found it from doing my own projects that it's really difficult to to push a project through to completion because especially when you're working independently obviously if it's if it's a studio thing and you've got time pressures it's different but when it's an independent project and essentially there's no deadline other than the deadlines you are setting for yourself it can be really difficult to get those projects to completion because um as you move through everyone's really excited at the beginning and you have the shoot which is the really exciting bit and then in post-production what generally happens is people sort of drop away from the project people aren't as invested in it certainly you know the actors don't have that much to do anymore with it unless they have to do adr and stuff but mostly their job is done um and most of the crew their jobs are finished so there's not that same excitement and momentum um when you're trying to actually just get the thing finished um so it was really it was really, it was really important to me that, that that we didn't lose that and i think uh um yeah, I think we sort of provided that to each other in a way. Um, it was, um, yeah, and I'm really grateful as well to be that, that I was able to be involved in that in the post production to that extent because, as, as, as I say, it's not something that usually happens. I mean, normally the writer's job ends when the script is finished. Once once the film's shooting, the writer doesn't really tend to get much of a say, and 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 then you normally wait a number of years and by the time you sort of see the thing, you've kind of moved on and forgotten about it. Um, but in this, it really was. Uh, I really felt like I was able to have a bit more authorship over it, and it, 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 it felt more. Uh, I felt a lot closer to it towards the end, and I think. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't be able to do that on a on a bigger production, but because it was independent, um, and you know, everyone's kind of at that stage working on it because they they, they love it. it uh, well, I've got a couple of things that I'm working on at the moment. Uh, I've been working on a sci-fi tv series uh that's uh, working with it with the production team well we, we're kind of it's very much in development at the moment but um there's uh, i've been working on that and i've just written my first novel uh which is a, a kind of horror comedy about a witch called uh, jenny ringo which is it's based on a series of short films i did um it's more kind of supernatural horror but it's, the comedy is probably very similar to penguin wesker in a way uh it's quite yeah it's quite silly but um yeah so i've just finished that um and yeah i mean uh, there, there was talk very early on and i don't know i don't even know if this, if this is possible anymore uh but there was there was talk of of, of a, a paintball massacre sequel and i've i think at one point i did just in case kind of make a plan for how that would go because I, I think the original idea was that it would be a trilogy i don't i didn't really figure out i did well i had an idea for the third one um but the second one i had a pretty clear i mean brendan had an idea for to be honest and and uh i sort of ran with that a bit uh but i i definitely have a very clear idea about who the killer is and where that's going to go <laughs> so i don't know i would be really nice to be able to do that one day and and uh play out that story um uh particularly with jess i think i think her character has a lot more to do and a lot uh, a few more places to go uh and it's quite it could be quite an interesting story arc um 
but uh, yeah, so there is there is that 